Well, welcome to part one of a new series we're started today called Can't Stand Ya. My name is Clayton Walker. I'm the pastor here of the City Church. And if you're like me in my family, my guess is you've been binge watching some TV recently. You've been Netflixing, you've been Amazon uh, priming, you've been Huluing, whatever, whatever service you use, you've been watching some serious TV shows. And, and uh, my guess is some of those shows have been funny. Like a lot of us, if I were to ask you, if I were to say, hey, what's your, your favorite, like all-time favorite comedy? Like just even say it right now, out loud. What's your all-time favorite comedy, okay? Some of you probably said The Office. Maybe you said Parks and Rec. Okay, one of mine for sure, like one of my top ones of all time for sure is Seinfeld. Now, I know some of you are like, what's Seinfeld? Well, you had to be like born in the the 80s and grow up in the 90s like to know what what Seinfeld is, but maybe you've watched it back. This is a great opportunity to to watch it back. Seinfeld's one of the funniest shows ever made. And in this show, in this series, there's a character. His name is George Costanza. And there's a picture coming up now of George. And in one of the episodes, George tells a story about his old high school coach. You see a picture of him right there. His old high school coach, man, it is a nasty, just just crude, uh, mean high school coach. And he can't say George's name right. And so George's last name is Costanza. But to make fun of him and to bully George, George's coach calls him can't stand you. And he says it real mean and nasty. Hey, can't stand you. And so George can't stand his coach and his coach can't stand him. And so the name fits. Well, what happens, what happens if you're having a hard time with the people in your house? Like what, what do you do right now if there's some people in your life, maybe in your own house that you can't stand? How do you deal with people that annoy you or even worse, people you can't stand? What about people you can't get away from right now. Well, in this series, we're going to chat about what the Bible says about getting along and how to fix broken relationships. Now, if you're like my family, if you're like my marriage, okay, we're all struggling this in right now because of the constant closeness, like the constant proximity is a challenge for even the best of marriages, for even the closest of marriages and relationships. And so this series is for me. It's for me and my wife, Darby, too. I'm preaching to myself. I'm preaching to us in our marriage, just like I am to you. So here's how this series is going to work. Because of our need for sports right now and the absence of sports in our lives, okay, the next three weeks, here's what, here's what it's going to look like. Today, we're going to talk about defense. Next week in week two, we're going to talk about the right offense. And then in week three, yeah, you guessed it, football fans, we're going to talk about special teams, all right? So here's what this is going to look like. Today, we're going to look, like, look at the prevent defense. How do we prevent World War III in our homes? And then next week, we're going to talk about the in-your-face offense. And then week three, special teams, we're going to talk about forgiveness. And so I hope you'll join us each week of this series. But today, we're going to talk about and we're going to break down the prevent defense. Now, if you're familiar with football and defense in football, you know one of the defenses in football is called the prevent defense. And in this defense, what you're doing is allowing small gains, like you're allowing some yards, you're keeping everything in front of you in order to prevent the touchdown. So you're going to allow the, the little small passes or the little short runs in order to prevent, to defend against the touchdown, the game winner. And that's when the prevent defense is often used at the end of a half or at the end of a game to keep a team from scoring a touchdown. They'll allow all the little yards, they'll allow all the little gains, but they're going to try to prevent the touchdown that would win the game. So let me tell you more about what I'm talking about. If you got your Bible, go to Ephesians chapter four. You might be thinking, where is the prevent defense in the Bible? Well, I promise you it's there 
Jump on our app now, the City Church Lubbock. If you don't have it, download it in your app store, the City Church Lubbock. Uh, when you download it, when you get there, click on sermon notes and all the verses and the points are going to be there for you today. And I promise today, you're gonna wanna lean in and take some notes and learn what the Bible says about dealing with people you can't stand and what the Bible says about healing broken relationships. So let's go. Ephesians chapter four, the verses and the points will also be there on the screen and you'll know when to fill in the blank in the notes uh, because those words will be in all caps there on your screen. And so you can fill in the blank as you go. And if you get a right answer, you get a little green line. And if you get a wrong answer, you'll get a red line telling you you've got a wrong answer answer and you need to change your answer to the right answer, which will be on the screen. So lean in, take notes on our app, and let's get something out of this time that we have here together. So Ephesians chapter four, Paul is writing a letter to the church at Ephesus. And here's what Paul says about dealing with people you can't stand and how to heal broken relationships. Ephesians four verse two says this, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance. All right, let's say that together. Those two words, all right, let's back up. And in your home and your couch, on your recliner, whatever you're, you're sitting in right now, maybe you're even in your underwear watching this. Maybe you got a blanket and you're all snuggled up, just all comfortable right now. But I want you to say these two words out loud with me on the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. Making allowance making allowance for each other's faults. Paul says, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults. Now in Colossians chapter three, Paul says something very similar. Colossians three, verse 13, he says this, make allowance, there's those two words again, make allowance for each other's faults. So here's our prevent Defense, you ready? You ready to fill in the blank? Here's the prevent defense. Give an allowance. Give them an allowance. Now you might be thinking, what are you talking about? I can't stand these people. They're annoying the heck out of me. You want me to reward that behavior? You want me to give them some money? No, no, that's not, that's not what I'm talking about here. You see, in Greek, allowance here means, and this is what the, the language that the New Testament was written in, and these are the words that Paul originally wrote in would have been Greek, and so it's helpful to know the definition of some of these words in the Greek language sometimes to get a fuller understanding of what is being talked about here. But Paul says this, give an allowance, and in Greek, here's what this, here's what this means. To be patient with, to bear with, to accept, to endure, to put up with and to suffer. Now, I know a lot of you are probably like, man, I'm enduring and putting up with a lot over here. Like I am suffering here in my house with these people. I can't get away from them. I'm suffering. I'm having to endure. I'm having to put up with a lot. And so we're gonna talk about today and in this series, how to suffer well how to suffer well, how to suffer well at home, how to suffer well at the office, how to suffer well in that class, how to suffer well with that neighbor that annoys you and maybe you can't stand. So to know what this means, to know more about what giving an allowance means, what Paul's talking about here, making allowance for people's faults. That's our prevent defense. All right, now we got to break this defense down. We got to study it and get to know more about it. And the first thing you got to understand about this allowance is the spirit of this allowance. You've got to understand and know the spirit of allowance. Paul says in Ephesians chapter four, be humble, gentle, patient. You see, Paul is talking about the spirit in which you approach someone, your attitude. That's what Paul's talking about here. He's talking about your spirit, the, the spirit in which you talk with people, the spirit in which you, you, you treat people, okay? That's what Paul's talking about here. In Philippians chapter two, Paul says this about this spirit, this attitude that we should have and where this spirit of allowance comes from. Ephesians 2, verse five, should be right there on your screen. It says this, Paul says, in your relationships with one another, have the same 
mindset. In other words, have the, the same approach, the same attitude, the same spirit as Christ Jesus. Verse six, who being in very nature God, Jesus, Paul is saying, is God. He was God in the flesh, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. So Paul says, Jesus was God, but he didn't consider his position or his identity as something to be used for his own advantage. Verse seven, rather, watch this, watch this. He made himself nothing by taking the very nature of, watch this, a servant. So Jesus, God in the flesh, takes on the nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found as appearance of, as a man, watch this, he humbled himself. Jesus, God in the flesh, humbles himself by becoming obedient, even death on a cross. By becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Paul says, you should have the same mindset, the same spirit, the same attitude that Jesus had and that he did not consider his own interest above the interest of others. Instead, he denied himself the, the rights and the privilege of his position, what he was owed, what he deserved. And he took on flesh and he humbled himself and he took the nature, the spirit, the attitude, the approach of a servant. That was the approach of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, that was the spirit of Jesus, taking on the, the nature, the, the, the spirit, the likeness of a servant. Now, husbands and wives, let me talk to you for a second. First of all, husbands, when we talk about the spirit of allowance, Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 3, husbands, you must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding. You hear the, the spirit there, the approach, the, the mindset. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. Some translations say, don't treat your wife harshly, with a harsh spirit, with a harsh tone. She may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should, watch this, so your prayers will not be hindered. Now, Paul says your wife is weaker, and again, it's helpful to know what's being talked about here in its fullness in the Greek language. This means in comparison Physically, a woman is typically weaker than a man. And so what Paul is saying here, actually, is that a woman, typically, generally speaking, is more nurturing, is kinder, and sweeter. They may not be as strong physically, but their demeanor is kinder. It's sweeter. It's more nurturing. And so what Paul is saying here to, rather Peter is saying here to husbands in 1 Peter 3, don't take advantage of or dominate that kind, sweet spirit. But rather, husbands, you should be protecting and affirming her role and her spirit. You should be lifting her up, honoring her, celebrating this aspect of her, her spirit. You see, you can either crush her spirit or cultivate her spirit. That's what Peter is saying here in 1 Peter 3. Don't treat your wife harshly. Treat her with understanding. You can suck the life out of your wife or you can breathe life into her. She's going to thrive in your presence or dive in your presence. I don't know about you, but I want my wife to thrive and to flourish in my presence because of the way that I treat her. And so Peter says, don't, don't treat your wife harshly with that kind of harsh spirit that will suck the life out of your wife. No, you want to treat her with the kind of spirit that will cultivate and cause her spirit to thrive and to flourish. And there's a warning that's attached to this, men, husbands, that if you treat your wife harshly with a harsh tone, with a harsh spirit, with a harsh attitude, Peter says this, 
that your prayers will actually be hindered. Like your pursuit of God, your desire for God to to bless you and to lead you and to even give you wisdom and decision-making, like all of that will be hindered if you're treating your wife with a harsh spirit. It's the idea of interruption. It's like you could be praying and it's almost as if God is saying here and what Peter's saying here in his word, you, you could be praying and it's like, whoa, whoa, wait, 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 whoa, 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 stop right there. You gotta go and make that right because you've been treating your wife harshly. And so your prayers are, are hindered. That's how important this is in a marriage, husbands. That's how important it is for us to not treat our wives harshly with a harsh spirit. It's so important. God says through Peter and first Peter that your prayers will actually be hindered because of the way that you treat your wife. Now, wives, the Bible has a lot to say about your spirit and your attitude. In Proverbs chapter 19, verse 13, it says this, a quarrelsome wife, or another way to say it would be a nagging wife, is as annoying as a constant dripping. Proverbs 21, verse nine, it's better to live alone in the quarter of an addict than with a quarrelsome or a nagging wife. Proverbs 21, verse 19, it's better to live alone in the desert than with a quarrelsome or nagging, complaining wife. And so in Proverbs, we learn that it's, it's a, a nagging or a quarrelsome wife is like a constant dripping. It's better to live alone in a corner. It's better to live alone in the desert and die of thirst than it is to live with a quarrelsome, a complaining, a nagging wife. So husbands, wives, you can see the power of the spirit in which we approach each other. As it's been said before, it's not always what we say, it's how we say it. And when we say that, what we're referring to, what we're talking about is the spirit, the attitude, the approach. You see, you've got to understand the spirit of allowance, and that our spirit, our tone, our approach, our mindset should be the same as Christ Jesus. You see, your spirit has a lot of power. It can turn someone away. It can harden their heart. It can push them away. It can make them very cold towards you. But in 1 Peter 3, we also learn, if you read the whole chapter, that your spirit can also soften someone's heart and it can even win over an unbelieving spouse just by the way you treat them. That's the power of the spirit of allowance. Now, husbands and wives, you might be sitting there wondering, all right, that's great, like that's good, but who's going first? Like who's gonna give in first and take on the nature of the servant? Who's gonna give in first and not demand what's rightfully theirs, but humbles themselves. Who's going first? Well, I got good news for you. I've got good news for you. Someone already went first and his name is Jesus. Jesus went first. Isn't that great news? Jesus went first. He denied himself his, the privilege and the right that was due to him. And he humbled himself. He took on flesh. He took on the nature of a servant. Jesus went first. That's why Paul says in Philippians 2, your attitude, your spirit should be the same as Jesus who went first. Now, some of you, like me, you might be wondering, okay, well, then who goes next? Jesus went first. That's great news. But who goes next? You do. You go next. Now, I know you're probably thinking, what do you, what do you mean you? Like her, him, who, who, who's you? You do. You see, the Bible says when you got married, when you made that covenant with God, two became one. Two became one. God sees you as one. That's why God says it and Jesus repeats it in the gospels. So what God has joined together, let man not separate. So I want to remind you and my wife and I, especially because of the stress of this season, you are on the same team. 
You're on the same team. God has joined you together. And so you're next. Like you together, because you are one now. You are on the same team. And it's going to take teamwork. Teamwork is going to be required to make it through this season. Teamwork is required. You must have that kind of approach where you approach this season and daily life right now and the stress of this season together. You've got to approach it together on the same team. And so right now, I want you to look at everyone in your house, husbands, wives, kids, whoever you're with, roommates, look at everybody in the house right now and say, same team, same team. Come on, you can do it. Say it out loud. I know you may not want to participate, but just do it right now. Let's get awkward. Let's get weird. Just say it right now with me. Same team. You're on the same team. Jesus went first and he has set the example for the spirit and what the spirit of allowance looks like. All right, let's get practical now. Secondly, you've got to understand in the prevent defense, you've got to understand the currency of allowance, the currency of allowance. Like, what are you allowing? We've got the spirit of allowance, our approach, our, our mindset, our attitude, but now what are we going to allow? Well, here's what this word in Greek means for false, that we're going to make allowance for. We're making allowance for each other's faults. Well, what, what does this word mean? Well, it means annoyances, and difficulties. In other words, it's minor issues. It's minor issues. Now, let me introduce you to Rosie. Rosie's an important member of the Walker household, and you see a picture now of Rosie. Yes, it's our Roomba that <laughs> cleans our house. Rosie is very special to me. And if you uh, have watched the Jetsons growing up, you know why we named her Rosie. Uh, but I, I love Rosie. And everyone in my family knows how much I love Rosie because I like things in order. I like things clean. I like things put away and put up. And so, so I love Rosie because Rosie vacuums my house every day. Now you might be thinking every day, like seriously, like, yeah, seriously, I run Rosie every day. And when I turn her on or when I uh, program her in the app that I have that goes along with it, I will almost always pick up the chairs in our table, uh, the bar stools, I'll put everything up, I'll pick up rugs and things, and I will do this almost every day. And now the kids know and they help me and they clean up and they put, pick stuff up off the floor so that Rosie can vacuum our house. Now, this I think drives my wife crazy. She's taken pictures of stuff. She sends it to our friends. She makes fun of me for this. It probably bothers her. Like if she was honest, she would probably say it annoys her. It bothers her. But even though it's not something that she would do, and even though it's not something she probably prefers or gets excited about, even though she would say, if she was on it, it probably annoys her. She never gets upset with me. At least I don't ever see it. She never makes it obvious, even though I like to run Rosie every single day. One of the applications I was reading, or commentaries rather, uh, that I was reading for uh, these verses said this about patience. Patience is the exercise of a largeness of soul that can endure annoyances and difficulties over a period of time. Let me say that again. Patience is the exercise of a largeness of soul that can endure annoyances and difficulties, those faults that Paul is referring to, over a period of of time. Now, I know some of you are like, man, I need me some of that. I need some of that kind of patience to make it through this season because I'm getting all kinds of annoyed with the people in my house and I need some patience. So, so, so what does this look like to allow these 
annoyances, these difficulties, these minor issues. Well, to understand the currency of allowance, here's what you've got to understand and here's what you've got to do. Here's how you're gonna grow in patience. You've got to major on the majors and minor on the minors. This is the currency of allowance. Majoring on the majors and minoring on the minors. Now let's talk about the majors first. First of all, in the majors, here's what we're going for. In the majors, we aim for unity. In the major things, like in the major issues of life, we're aiming for unity. Paul wrote this in Ephesians chapter four, starting in verse three. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all who is over all, in all, and living through all. So what are the majors? Well, these are clear biblical issues. In our Undecided series we did earlier this year, we talked about the major clear biblical issues that we should all be unified on. We talked about this some in our series last summer called Creed, when we talked about our belief in our theology of the Bible, what we believe about the Bible. We'll do that again this summer when we go through our Creed series and we talk about the doctrine of sin. There are things in the scripture, there are major things in the scripture that we must all agree on, that we can't compromise on. And the scripture would actually say that when a message that's different from the one that we read or hear in the scripture is preached, it's false teaching or a false teacher. And so Paul says in Ephesians 4, there's one body, there's one spirit, there's one hope, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one father of all. There are things in the scripture, there are majors in the scripture that we must all agree on. We must be unified on and we can't compromise. And these majors are things that should shape and form and direct and determine our marriage and what we believe about marriage, our parenting and how we parent, our finances, and yes, even our politics. These majors in the scripture should inform, should direct, should shape what we believe in all these different ways. And so in the majors, we're aiming for this unity. And you might be thinking, how could we be unified on major things like that? Like on those huge issues of, of life and faith, how can we be unified on all those things? Well, Paul says in Ephesians 4, Christ is overall in living through all. So if we follow Jesus, we have the, this, this one Lord that's living in us. We have this one spirit that's living in, in all of us and as followers of Jesus, as we love and follow Jesus, this spirit inside of us leads us to God's truth and gives us the same mind and the same heart. It's amazing when you read through the book of Acts, it says they were of one mind and one heart. They believed the same things. They were pursuing the same things because they had one faith, one Lord Jesus and one spirit that indwelled and filled them all. And so this word that Paul uses in Ephesians 4, binding yourselves together, is the idea of being prisoners bound to one of another. And as followers of Jesus, we're bound to Christ, and so that means we're bound to each other. And so we're in this thing together. We're on the, the same team, unified on the majors. But now let's talk about the minors. In the majors, we aim for unity. In the minors, though, watch this, we allow for liberty. In the minors, we allow, we're making allowance for liberty. Paul writes in Romans 14, verse one, accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. So what are the minors? Well, these are the things that annoy you, the things that, are non-biblical issues. 
things that are unclear or debatable or even maybe audience issues that we see in the scripture. Major doctrines like eschatology and ecclesiology, what we believe about the end times and the way that's going to happen or ecclesiology, the way that the church is structured and what it takes to be a church and what the strategy of the church should be. These are things that great people that love Jesus great, good-hearted followers of Jesus disagree on. They're debatable issues. They are minor issues. And so we allow for liberty. These are places where we must compromise and allow for different opinions, different methods, preferences, and strategies. The problem right now, though, is in the season that we find ourselves in, is that in our families, in our homes, with your roommates, with your spouse, the spotlight is on the minors. It just is. These minor issues that annoy us, these differences of opinion and methods and preferences and strategies. And so we say things like, why are you doing it like that? Stop doing that. Stop doing it like that. We have differences of opinion on minor issues. And so you can see why this currency of allowance, majoring on the majors, minoring on the minors, making allowance for each other's faults, for those minor things that annoy us, for those differences in opinion and preferences and strategies and methods. You can see why this currency of allowance is so important, majoring on the majors, minoring on the minors. Because the spotlight right now is front and center and it's bright and it's highlighting all the minor issues. And so here's what I want us to do today. And here's my prayer for this series is that we will zoom out. Like even today, as we spend time together in God's word and God's presence in this series, as we talk about all of this, we will zoom out. And here's how we're going to zoom out. We're going to give each other some space. We're going to encourage some ways to relieve stress separately. That might be letting your spouse go on a run or go for a walk. That might be getting your kids out of the house to go play in the backyard or out front, go to a park. Whatever that looks like for you, you need to allow for some space to relieve stress separately. And then if you're a married couple, then you get to come together and relieve stress together. Right? And that's the fun part. But we're going to zoom out right now. We're going to zoom out by having a good scream. Maybe having a good cry. Maybe having a good laugh. We're going to zoom out by taking a deep breath. Even right now, do it with me. Just take in a deep breath. Let's reset right now. This morning, let's reset this series. Let's reset. It's what it's all about. And you might be wondering, well, where's the, that, that power to reset come from? Where's this power to allow these minor things go? Where, how, how can I do this? How is this possible? Well, the third part of the prevent defense that you've got to understand about making allowances is the source of allowance. You've got to understand the source of allowance, like how this is possible, how you're going to make allowance. How is this possible? Well, let's go back to our verse, Ephesians 4, verse 2. It's up on the screen now, and it says this. Paul writes, always be humble and gentle, be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults. Now watch this. Here's the last part that we left off earlier. Because of your love. Because of your love. That's how all of this is possible. Because of your love. A couple of weeks ago, um, me and my boys, Levi and Coben, got outside and we were cleaning up all this, this mud that had gathered in front of our house in the curb. We live in a new development and so all this mud and stuff is out in our, our curb and we got out there with shovels and, and hose and stuff and we were moving all this mud and picking up all this mud and, and spraying it all down. We were cleaning it all up. I mean, it was hours of hard work. And when we were done, 
I gave my boys some money for helping me. They did a good job. It was a hard day's work and they did a great job. And so I gave them some money for helping me. They, they earned it. Now, some of you are like, no, no, no. My kids help me. They're not getting any money. All right. Uh, th that's part of living in our house. Okay. Some of you do allowance. Some of you don't. Some of you give an allowance because of the things they do. Some of you don't. You say, well, they live in our house, they're gonna help out and they're not gonna get an allowance. Their allowance is food and clothing and shelter, right? But some of us give an allowance or if there's a special project, maybe you, you give some money for that extra help. Well, that day I gave my boys some money for that extra hard work they did helping me clean up the front of our house. They earned that money. They earned that allowance if you will. This allowance that Paul's talking about is very different. It's not earned. It comes from a different place. This love that Paul is talking about here in Ephesians chapter four, that gives us the power to give and to make an allowance, that gives us the power for the prevent defense. This love isn't earned. It comes from a different place. One of the commentaries I was reading said this, that this love that Paul's talking about here in Ephesians 4 does not have its origin in human motivation. It is a choice made because of the love of God. First John says this, you love your brother because the love of God is in you. If you don't love your brother, then the love of God is not in you. You see, God's love is either in you or it isn't. You can't create this love. You can't do better or try harder at loving. You either have the love of God in you that allows you and gives you the power to make allowance or you don't. And so if you've experienced the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, then you can't help but extend love, give love, grace, and mercy. You see, in the majors, we aim for unity. In the minors, we allow for liberty. But now watch this. In everything, we approach with charity. We approach with, with charity with that love, that grace, that, that mercy that we've experienced, that we've encountered in God. And we can't help but extend it. And so in everything we approach with charity, Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 13, verse two, if I hold in my mind, not only all human knowledge, but also the very secrets of God, and I have faith that can move mountains, but I have no love, I amount to nothing at all. Love, this love of God, it's either in you or it isn't. And it's what gives you the, the power to make allowance for each other's faults. It's what gives you the power to major on the majors and, and minor on the minors. This love, this Greek word agape in Ephesians 4, it's not a feeling or an emotion that gives you the power to make allowance. It's not a feeling or emotion. It's an act of the will and it's always costly. Think back to Philippians chapter two, what Paul said about Jesus. That was a costly love for Jesus to choose to set aside his divine right and privilege and to come down to this earth, to take on flesh, to humble himself, to take on the nature, the attitude of a servant. That was an act of the will. That's a kind of love that's costly. It was a choice. Paul says in Romans 5, verse 8, God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died in our place for our sin while we were sinners. In other words, while we were his enemies, God loved his enemies so much 
He loved rebels so much. He loved people who had turned their backs on him so much. He loved them so much that he chose to send his one and only son to die in their place for their sin, to take on the wrath of God for sin. That's how much God loved you. And he demonstrated, he proved it by choosing to send his son to die in your place, to pay your fine for sin that you and I owe. That's how much God loves you. He demonstrated it. He proved it. So watch this. God can't stand your sin, but he loves you anyway. God can't stand your sin, but he loves you anyway. And that's the heart of God. It's that love that's a choice and it's always costly. And some of you are here today and you've never given your life to Jesus. And I want to tell you today, if you were to die, if tonight you were to die and you were to stand before the Father and you've never given your life to Jesus, then you would hear, depart from me, I never knew you. And you would spend eternity separated from God in hell where you would bear the wrath of God for your sin. You see, you break God's law, you pay God's fine. And God's fine for sin is eternity separated from him in hell. But God loves you so much that even though he couldn't stand your sin, he loved you anyways. And he sent his son to die in your place for your sin. Sin, And when you've encountered this love of God, this mercy, this, this grace of God, when you've encountered it, then you can't help but extend that same kind of love, the exact same kind of love and grace and mercy that you've encountered, that you've experienced. You can't help but extend that, that even though you can't stand what that person may be doing, you love them anyways. You, you love them anyways. It's where the the power comes from. It's this love of God that's inside of you that gives you the power to reset right now, to take a deep breath and to reset and to start majoring on the majors and minoring on the minors. If you've experienced the love of God, then the love of God is in you. It changes your spirit right now in this moment that maybe has grown hard. Maybe it's grown cold to the people in your house. Maybe to that spouse that's sitting on the other end of the couch right now. It's the love of God in you that's softening your heart right now that maybe has grown so cold and so hard to the people that you're closest to. It's the love of God that's in you right now that's softening your heart and is going to give you the the power to make an allowance, to major on the majors and minor on the minors. It's the love of God. That's your power. That's the, the source of the allowance. So today, here's what I... I want you to see, here's the the prevent defense kind of all wrapped into one statement. It's up on your screen right now. It says this, allow the minor to prevent the major. You're going to allow the minor to prevent something major. Now you might be sitting there thinking, well, what do you do when there's been a major? What do you do if you got a, a major problem? Well, that takes offense and special teams. And that's where we're headed the next two weeks. So you'll have to come back for that. But if you can't look at your spouse right now and say, we're on the same team, you aren't ever coming together to relieve some stress. Then you need to talk about why you don't feel like you're on the same team. And if you aren't able to have that conversation, I know I may be stating the obvious, something you already know, but that's a problem. If you can't even have the conversation about feeling like you're not on the same team, then you need to seek out some help. You need a counselor. And we're gonna be talking more about dealing with the the major like broken relationships next week and, and the week after that. But allowing 
the minor to prevent something major is a choice. It's a choice, but you can't do it. Like you can't do it on your own. Here's what's amazing with the 12 that Jesus chose to follow him is that there were two in the group who would have hated each other. You see, there was a guy named Simon who was a zealot and the zealots were a sect of the Jews that wanted to forcefully and militarily remove the Romans from power. In other words, they were for hostile takeover and they were known to be terrorists. Jesus invited Simon the zealot to follow him. He also invited a guy named Matthew to follow him who was a tax collector. And the tax collectors were viewed as traitors by their Jewish brothers and sisters because they were collecting taxes from the Jewish people and paying them to their Roman overlords who were occupying their country. And so you've got Simon the zealot, a terrorist who wants to overthrow the Roman government. And you've got Matthew, the tax collector, who's taking money, collecting taxes from his Jewish people and giving them money to the Romans. How do these two people ever get along? Surely they couldn't stand each other. Yet they both followed Jesus and they did life together for three years. Here's what F.F. Bruce said in his book, The Spreading Flame, about Matthew and Simon being among the 12. He said this, the, the inclusion of a man who collected taxes for the Roman overlords or for their vassal Herod Antipas gave occasion for unfavorable comment. The inclusion of a zealot, one of those who sought to hasten the divine kingdom by violence and gave no quarter to the Romans or their creatures is equally noteworthy. Matthew's inclusion must have called for a good deal of forbearance or patience on the part of the fishermen in the company, but that the same company should have been able to contain both Matthew the tax collector and Simon the zealot was a miracle. F.F. F. Bruce said the fact that Matthew and Simon were both among the 12 and loved Jesus and followed Jesus and ended up loving each other was an absolute miracle. How was that possible? How could two people that typically and traditionally could not stand one another, how could they both love and follow Jesus? How could they do life together with Jesus for all those years? F.F. F. Bruce said it was a miracle. That miracle was made possible by their mutual love for Jesus. That's how it was possible. You see this allowing the minor to prevent something major, it's gonna take a miracle. It's gonna take a miracle. You can't do it on your own. And so let's pray now for God to help us, for God to fill us with his love that we might make allowance for each other's faults. Would you pray with me? God, we pray right now in this moment for the Holy Spirit to fill us with a power to aim for unity, a grace to allow for liberty and a love to approach each other with charity. God, in this moment, would you overwhelm us with your love, with your grace, with your mercy, so much so that we couldn't help but have our hearts soften, that we couldn't help but take a huge breath, a deep breath right now. Hit reset and begin to make allowance for each other's faults. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.